Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuhu. Peace and blessings be upon you, and thank you for joining us for our third installment of Quranic Tafsir, taught by our local Chicago Shiyukh. This class will take place for the first 21 days of Ramadan, and inshallah we'll cover all 30 juz of the Quran. My name is Amina Sharif, and I will be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to introduce, to introduce to you uh, today's speaker, Sheikh Asfaruddin. Sheikh Asfaruddin is the Imam and resident scholar at Islamic Foundation North in Libertyville, Illinois. He completed his Hif of the Quran at the Institute of Islamic Education, where he also began the Alamiya program. He completed the program, including Dara al Hadith from Dara al Ulum Online, and he is currently pursuing a master's in Islamic theology from the American Islamic College. He's also the CEO and of Concise Advice, a YouTube channel that aims to teach different aspects of Islam through Muslim scholars, doctors, lawyers, and other Muslim professionals. Today, Sheikh Asfar will be covering Surah Al Maida and Surah Al An'am. Uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the at the end of the lecture. So please post your questions on Facebook and YouTube. And without further ado, I turn the forum over to Sheikh Asfar. Bismillahi rahman rahim Bismillahi walhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Qala ta'ala Wa in khiftum shiqaqa baynihima fab'athu hakaman min ahlihi wa hakaman min ahliha. Wa qala ta'ala يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا قوامين لله شهداء بالقسط شهداء بالقسط ولا يجرمنكم شنآن قوم على أن لا تعدلوا اعدلوا هو أقرب للتقوى واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون. صدق الله العظيم. I recited before you the eighth ayah of Surah Al-Ma'idah. We are going to come back to this ayah at the end of this talk. Muslim leaders often say we need to be united. My question is, what does that even mean? We need to be united. Go ahead and put it on the chat box. What does it mean to you when you hear someone say, we need to be united? We've all heard numerous talks about the importance of unity. But what does that even mean? Some Muslims say being united is everyone praying in one masjid or everyone following one madhab or everyone praying behind one sheikh in the exact same manner, or everyone dressed the same way. Is this, is this what the Ummah Wahida really is? Is this the Ummah Wahida that Allah is referring to? Is this, what is, uh, is this what it means to be united? I don't think so. Unity in the Ummah is when I, when I love my brother, Regardless if he follows calculations for the, start, for the start of Ramadan or if he follows moon sighting. Unity in the Ummah is when I love my brother regardless if he prays 8 rak'ah for Salatul Tarawih or 20 rak'ah for Salatul Tarawih. Unity in the Ummah is when I love my brother regardless if he or she starts, their salat, starts the time for suhoor or ends the time for suhoor and starts the time for Salatul Fajr at when the sun is 15 degrees below the horizon or when the sun is 18 degrees below the horizon. I still love, love that brother or that sister. Unity is when I have disagreements with someone, but like Abu Bakr and Umar, after that disagreement occurs, I get closer to that person. I get closer to that person. You, you and I, when we disagree with one another, we stop talking to each other. Some of us have family members that we haven't spoken with just because of a disagreement. Ramadan is the month of forgiveness. You want Allah to forgive you. 
yet you can't forgive someone else because of a disagreement. Abu Bakr and Umar, they would disagree with one another. But after that disagreement, they would get closer to one another. How? How were they able to do this? The answer, part of that answer is in Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayah number 8. And that's what I would like to talk about today. We are commanded in the Qur'an to respect those, uh, the people of other faith when we argue with them. We're commanded to show respect when we argue with people of other faith. Allah says in chapter 16, ayah 125, ahsan, And argue with them in the best of manners. Argue with them in the best of manners. If this is the criteria of how we're supposed to speak with people of other faith when we argue with them, then what does that, sh what does that say? When we, how should we treat our fellow Muslims when we differ, especially when there is a valid difference of opinion? For example, we're used to the Hafs recitation. That's the common recitation. A friend of mine is a Qari. So he was, he was leading the Salah one day and he was reciting in the Warsh recitation. Afterwards, a brother came up to him and said, Qadi Saab, you are reciting in an incorrect manner. Please don't recite like this. And then the Qadi said, brother, I'm reciting according to the Warsh recitation. This is a valid way of reciting. The brother said, I'm not used to this. Don't recite like that. Right? Recite the way I'm used to. So this is what divides the ummah. This attitude that other people need to change because I haven't heard of this riwayah. This is what causes division. This is not a healthy mindset to have. Shaykh Hamza Yusuf was mentioning that in the Maliki Madhab, it is makruh for the Imam to make a congregational dua after the salah. It's makruh, according to the Maliki Madhab, to make a congregational dua after the salah. Ibn Abi Jamara mentions that if you try to implement that fatwa today, then it will cause fitna. Because this is the amal of the people. This is the urf of the people. This is the custom of the people. And this is just a dua. This is a dua. The other madahib allow you to make a congregational dua after the salah. Especially in those ma masajid where it's predominantly Hanafi. You will witness right after the salah, the imam will make a dua. He will make a dua. And if somebody doesn't want to make that dua with the imam, that's fine. If somebody makes the dua with the imam, that is fine as well. But don't go around saying, hey, that's bid'ah. These people are ahli bid'ah, people of innovation. That is what causes division in the ummah. When you have this mindset that this religion belongs to me and me only. And everybody else, they can go to the fire. Lakum deenukum waliyadeen. This is what is driving a lot of Muslims away. This is not a healthy psychological mindset to be in. The top two guys of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were Abu Bakr and Umar. When you read the ahadith, you find many narrations. كَانَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَأَبُو بَكَرْ وَعُمَرُ رَأَيْتُ النَّبِيَّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَأَبَا بَكَرْ وَعُمَرُ These two were always together. And they were always with Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. But did you know, my respected listeners, that these two differed with each other on numerous occasions? These two, Abu Bakr and Umar, they differed with each other on numerous occasions. They disagreed with those people who would not pay their zakat. After the death of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were certain Muslims who would not pay their zakat. Abu Bakr and Umar disagreed whether or not they were Muslims. Abu Bakr and Umar disagreed concerning the reality of the death of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Abu Bakr and Umar disagreed on where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam should be buried. Abu Bakr and Umar disagreed on who should succeed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as the next leader. Abu Bakr and Umar disagreed on the distribution of liberated lands. Abu Bakr and Umar disagreed on the captives of war. Abu Bakr and Umar disagreed on the financial provision for Muslims. They disagreed even on juristic issues. Yet, after their disagreement, they grew closer to one another. How? That's my topic for today. How can we disagree with one another and grow closer to one another like Abu Bakr and Umar did? One of the answers is in Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayah number 8. When Abu Bakr was passing away and he was lying on his deathbed, he nominated Umar as his successor. Someone came up to Abu Bakr and said, Oh Abu Bakr, how can you nominate Umar when you know about his harshness? How will you respond to Allah? How will you respond to Allah when Allah will ask you on the Day of Judgment, why did you nominate Umar when you knew about his harshness? Abu Bakr was on his deathbed. He's, he needed help getting up. So he said, Ajli Suni, Ajli Suni, help me get up. When he finally got up, he said, إِذَا سَأَلَنِي رَبِّي فَقُلْتْ إِسْتَخْلَفْتُ عَلَيْهِمْ بِخَيْرِ أَهْلِكْ when my Lord asks me why I nominated Umar, I will tell him I nominated the best of people. I nominated the best of people. Look how Abu Bakr talks about Umar in his absence. Integrity leads to unity. Even though they disagreed on several issues, Look how Abu Bakr talks about Umar in his absence. When the Muslims told Umar عن, when he became the leader of the Muslims, so someone tried to get brownie points with Umar عن, so he said to Umar, Oh Umar, Ya Amir al muminin you are better than Abu Bakr. You're better than the previous Khalifa. Umar radiallahu an started to weep and he said, Wallahi laylatum min Abi Bakr khayrum min Ali Umar. Wallahi one night of Abu Bakr is greater and better than one night, than the entire life of Umar and his family. One night of Abu Bakr is greater and better than the entire life of Umar and his family. Min Abi Bakr, and just one measly day of Abu Bakr khayrum min Ali Umar, is better and greater than the entire life of Umar and his family. These two men differed, but their hearts were synchronized. Their hearts were one. My respected brothers and sisters, don't surround yourself with yes men don't surround yourself with people who are afraid of telling you like it is abu bakr would constantly tell umar radiallahu an how just like how it is and as chicago bulls fans we admire michael jordan after ramadan not during ramadan but after ramadan we all will be watching the last dance documentary and we honor and we admire MJ. But MJ could learn a thing or two from Umar radiallahu an about how to handle criticism, how to receive brutal honesty. Charles Barkley was best friends with Michael Jordan. And he says that his friendship with Michael was irreparably damaged after Charles uh, criticized him because of his uh, decisions as an owner in the, uh, in the Charlotte Hornets. Of the Charlotte Hornets. So I want you to compare MJ's response to criticism with how Umar radiallahu anh responded with criticism. 
as I said earlier, Umar disagreed with Abu Bakr on those Muslims who did not pay zakat after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Umar said they were Muslims. Abu Bakr said, "Ya Umar, a jabbarun fil jahiliya wa khawarun fil Islam." Oh Umar, you were strong and ferocious in your days of jahiliya, and in your days as a Muslim, you're weak. You're weak. How are you separating salah from zakat when Allah 28 times connects salah with zakat? وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ وَآتُ الزَّكَاةِ Oh, Umar, stop, stop being weak. Umar radiallahu an got the message. Valid differences are okay. The problem is not with the differences. The problem is how we react to differences. We have Muslims today who will say, I'm not going to pray behind this Imam. He is Maturidi. Right? That's where the problem arises. We become divided over valid difference of opinions. In Adab al Ikhtilaf al Islam, a book titled The Ethics of Disagreement by Sheikh Taha. It is written that Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal would consider wudu to become invalid if blood dripped from the nose or if someone did hijama, someone did cupping, then that person's wudu would become invalid. Someone came up to Imam Ahmad and said, So would that mean you wouldn't pray behind someone who believes that wudu? does not become invalid if the uh, blood drips from the nose? Imam Ahmad responded by saying, how can I not pray behind Imam Malik? How can I not pray behind Imam Malik? Why is there disagreement amongst the scholars? That's a great question, but that's a topic for another day. And I would recommend you read Sheikh Mawlana Zakaria's book on this, the difference of the Imams, and then this will help you answer that question. But for today, moving, po moving forward, I want to conclude with this. What can we do to have unity? What can we do so that after we disagree with each other, we get closer to one another like Abu Bakr and Umar did? That's what I will conclude with. I'll give, I'll give seven tips according to the Quran and Sunnah. Tip number one, pursue the ethical truth. Pursue the ethical truth. For you to do this, you have to have a sincere intention. You have to have the mindset that I could be wrong. And if you have this mindset, something amazing can happen. What happens? You will have a greater awareness of the various possible aspects of the deen and the different interpretations of dalil, of evidence. So tip number one, pursue the ethical truth. A lot of times when we argue, we argue not because we have a concern for seeking the truth, but because of winning the argument. And then this causes shiqaq. وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ shiqaq. This is what causes division. So tip number one, if you want unity, you have to pursue the ethical truth. Tip number two, this is the ayah which I recited in the beginning. اِعْدِلُوا هُوَ أَقْرَبُ taqwa. Be just. That is closer to taqwa. Be just. That is closer to taqwa. Let me give you a scenario. Think about who you like the most. Think about your best friend. All right, you got your friend in your mind. Now think about that person who you really do not like. Now imagine. Your best friend got into an argument with the person that you really did not like. Would you support your best friend even though you knew that your best friend is in the wrong? 
Allah says, if you do this, this can cause disunity. وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا Justice is compromised when we despise someone. A person may testify against someone just because they don't like that person. Allah says, just because you don't like someone, it shouldn't prevent you from being just. Why? Because taqwa will lead to justice. And justice will lead to unity. No justice, no unity. Tip number three, clearly define goals. One of the reasons why Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was such an amazing leader was he had the ability to encourage everyone to work together towards a common goal. A common vision. What was this vision? What was this goal? The transformation of Arab society towards the spread of belief of Tawheed. That was the vision. Tawheed, Risala, Akhirah. Belief in one God. And it's important that all the team members are aware of these goals. Once you, once you define your goals and your vision, all the team members need to be aware of your vision. And the Sahaba knew the vision of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Tabi'een, the followers and the successors, they all knew the vision of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Without a clearly defined goal, everyone will run in different directions. And this is what you see, you saw this happening after the death of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Everyone was running in different directions, up until Abu Bakr radiallahu an eloquently reminded everyone of the goals. Man kana ya'budu Muhammad, whoever worships Muhammad, let him know that Muhammad is dead. That was never our goal. وَمَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتُ But he who worships Allah, let him know that Allah is everlasting and will never die. If you want unity, you gotta have clearly defined goals. Tip number four. You have to clearly define roles. If you want unity, you have to clearly define roles. And this is what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. He gave the companions different roles to fulfill. Some of the companions would teach the Quran. Some of the companions were write the Quran. Some of the companions were political leaders. Some of the companions were military. Uh, they, used to, they used to go to war. Right? That, that, was their, uh, that was their role military leaders. Some of the companions would take care of the general household of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some of the companions would give the adhan. Some of the companions would distribute sadaqah and zakat to the poor and needy. Everyone had their role. As Coach Tibbs says, know your role. And this is what the companions did and this is why there was unity amongst the uh, Sahaba. If anyone went out of their went out of their roles, and they did not stay in their lane, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam would strongly and harshly reprimand them. If anyone stepped out of stepped out of their roles, not every Sahabi was a qualified scholar. So if a Sahabi issued a fatwa. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would reject that fatwa and then he would reprimand them sharply for making a legal decision without having the proper tools. So if you want unity, you got to have clearly defined roles and make sure everyone stay, stay within their roles. Tip number five, if you want to have unity, everyone must learn the ethics of disagreement. A friend of mine is a teacher, and he had a lesson plan titled, It's Okay to Argue. And you may think, 
what kind of lesson plan is that? We don't want our kids to argue. That's the last thing we need, our kids to argue in class. But let me ask you one thing. The eight rakat versus 20 rakat debate in, in Ramadan, does that ever end? It was there last year. It was, it was there the year before. It doesn't end. What about the moon sighting versus calculations? Is that going to end anytime soon? No. What about the 15 degrees versus 18 degrees for the start of Fajr? Is that going to end? Those issues come up every Ramadan. The key is now to learn the ethics of disagreement. The key is now how to deal appropriately with different points of view. So what my teacher would do in class, he has this strategy called SCAN, which, which, sta which stands for stop, clarify, ask questions, and what now? So first step would be SCAN. Scan and stop and think about the issues. They can take a whiteboard and write down the concerns, divide the whiteboard into two, and then write down the concerns on that whiteboard. The second step is to clarify. Clarify the issue. This is where the other person can say after listening to the issue, if I understand you correctly, you are saying... So the next step is to clarify. The third step in the scan strategy is to ask. Ask what is most important. And this is where you go back to the goals, the clearly defined goals. And the last step is to learn the ethics of disagreement. And that is now. N would stand for now. Now what are the next steps? Tip number five is learn the ethics of disagreement. Tip number six, establish trust. If you want unity, you will have to establish trust. And this takes time. You have to earn trust. What is the best way to establish trust? Go ahead and put the answer on, the, on this uh, chat box. And I'll, I want to hear from you, what are, what are your, how would you establish trust? One of the best ways that I think we can establish trust is by reading the seerah of Al-Amin, the trustworthy. And tip number seven, this is the last tip on how to have unity, and that is practice. Unity requires practice. Practice. Now, yes, practice. Yes, Iverson. It requires practice. You will fail at unity. You will fail at working with another person. But when you fail at unity with another fellow Muslim brother or sister, find another way to make it work. Because with practice, it is possible. It is possible. As long as the first six things are there, right? As long as you all have a shared common goal, a shared common vision, you are pursuing the ethical truth, you are just. And so if you have all of those six things, which I mentioned earlier, then with practice, you will have unity. Make dua to Allah, Ya Allah, make us people of taqwa. Ya Allah, make us people of taqwa. Ya Allah, make us people of taqwa. Ya Allah, please unite our hearts. Ya Allah, synchronize our hearts. Because when we are divided, ikhtilaf is ja'iz. But having valid differences is permissible. But the farruq, division is haram. Because when we are divided, that is when we are at our weakest. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'll stop for Q and A. Thank you very much, Sheikh, for uh, for discussing how to avoid division in the community, and I really appreciate that scan strategy. I think that's very important, especially with all the debates around the fiqh of Ramadan. So we have a few uh, questions related to that. Um, 
Well, let's start with the uh, first question that came in. Uh, sorry, one second. Um, what are some steps we can take in our daily life to control our nafsi reaction to disagreements, disagreements with community members, disagreements in our household, since we're you know, stuck at home, um, spending more time with our family and maybe having more disagreements with them? Yeah. yeah, a lot of times, I'll just use my own personal experience. When I disagree with my spouse and I'm not budging and she's not budging, we, decide to meet later on the issue. And this is very hard to do because, especially when you love someone, you want to solve that issue right there. But successful couples, they find a way to disagree with one another and meet later. So you can, first, you could, you could try to compromise. First, you should stop, right? That, that's, what, that's what the scan strategy is all about. Stop and analyze. And then see if you can compromise. If you can't compromise, then sometimes what we do is, okay, Sana, you were right on this one. Your argument made much, made, made much more sense. And then sometimes she will say, no, Afbari, your argument made more sense. But sometimes I'm not budging and she's not budging. So then we decide to meet later uh, when, when uh, cooler heads prevail. I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, another question is, to what extent should we be accommodating? How do we identify the thin red line of implementing the guidelines of Islam and being accommodating to someone who has a different set of views and a different lifestyle from us? Yeah, that's a very good question. Very good question, mashallah. So there's a, different be there's a difference between a difference of opinion versus a valid difference of opinion. There's a few questions you, you have to ask yourself. Number one, who asked this opinion? Who, or who made this statement? So if you are having a procedure on your knee and all of the specialists and all the surgeons recommended that you have this procedure on your knee, and a random person without any qualifications comes up to you and says, no, you don't need this procedure. You, sh you, should, you should do this procedure. So number one, you have to have the necessary qualifications. Who is the first question you have to ask? Who is the person that is making this opinion? And the next question you have to ask, are they making their opinion based on an academic, ac academic understanding of the Quran and Sunnah? So maybe a sheikh gives an opinion, but was it actually from an academic point of view from the Quran and Sunnah? And the third and last opinion you have to, the third and last thing you have to keep in mind is, what is the nature of the statement? What is the nature of the opinion? So if, if you're having a debate with someone and they say, mm, I think Allah is one. And another person says, no, I think Allah is three. Let's compromise. Allah is two. Right? So that is not a valid difference of opinion because you are going against the very fabric of what Islam teaches. You're going against Tawheed. So you should ask those three questions to ascertain whether this is just another opinion or is this an actual valid difference of opinion. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we have some more questions from the audience. Um, there's one, what is the best way to promote our beautiful religion, Yashay? Yeah. For me, I think the best way to promote the deen is by indirect da'wah. There's direct da'wah where you go out and preach you go to your neighbors and you knock on their doors and you say, this is why you should become a Muslim. But what I found to be more effective is indirect da'wah. I'll share one example. And that da'wah is not just for non-Muslims, it's for Muslims as well. So someone asked me, 
this is before the masjids closed down. Imam, you have a good relationship with the youth. The youth are all, they're all in the back and they're not doing their dhikr. They're not praying their sunnahs. You should tell them to pray their sunnah prayers. I said, I can do that. That's direct da'wah. I can do that. But I feel like it's more effective with this particular youth that I show them with my actions that I'm going to be praying the sunnah prayers. I'm going to be doing the dhikr. And they may not do the dhikr or the sunnah prayers that day or that week, but they see me doing it and it becomes ingrained in their brain that, oh, this is what you're supposed to do when you come to the masjid. So indirect da'wah, I feel, is much more effective um, to preach and to uh, share this beautiful deen. Definitely. I definitely agree with that. Um, there's another question. Can you touch on the topic of the tricks of shaitan and how we should be, we should still be aware of him in Ramadan, even if the shayateen are locked up? Yeah, very good question. So Shaitan has a lot of tricks. And it's easy for me to say to you, guys, do this, do step one, do step two, and then do step three, and Shaitan will not come near you. But as Ibn Arabi states, Man arafa nafsahu, arafa rabbahu. You have to first know yourself. You have to know your tendencies. What are your weaknesses? What are your strengths? Once you find out your weaknesses and your strengths, find a way to break that bad habit. Um, and as Allah states, as powerful as Iblis is, إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ لَهُ sultan. Iblis has absolutely no influence on my servants, those who have Iman and those who put their tawakkul in Allah. So I would do a little bit of uh, self-reflection and find out what are your tendencies, uh, what are your weaknesses, and then create your own customized goals through these SMART goals. This only takes five minutes. Start off with what is one thing that you want to change about yourself? What is one specific quality about yourself that you want to change, that you feel like shaitan has too much influence on you? M, okay, let's make this measurable. How can I make this measurable instead of vague? What is the time period? What will be the deadline? Is this relevant? And so once you complete the goals handout, the smart goals handout, and you create your own customized goals, this is the best way of not allowing shaitan to enter your hearts. I feel like this is much more effective than me saying, guys, do one, two, and three. So you know your situation best. This is you have to do some inner reflection um, and do the homework. Thank you, Sheikh. And this next question will probably have to be our last one. Um, it is Assalamu alaikum. I am a convert to Islam. My parents are very devout Catholics. The topic of Islam used to be a source of tension for them. Now they just don't talk about it. I'm concerned that their beliefs are shirk. How do I do dawa to my parents in a way that is effective? They see me as a daughter who they have to teach, not listen to. Yeah. Salam alaikum, Bina. Nice to see you here, mashallah. That's a great question. As I said earlier, indirect dawa is much more effective than direct dawa for, for the long term. And at the end of the day, even though you have practiced all of the principles of da'wah, you spoke with wisdom and you responded with wisdom. Allah says, You did everything what the Quran and Sunnah tells you to do. Allah says, So there's two types of hidayah. One type of hidayah is, You can guide and show someone the truth. And there's also the hidayah of flipping the hearts. That is something that is not in our control. Allah says very emphatically to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ Oh Muhammad, you cannot flip the heart. 
you cannot guide someone to a certain path. So Allah says this very emphatically to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we do our best, and at the end of the day, we have to ask Allah. He is the flipper of the hearts. Ya muqallib al qulub. Ya Allah, flip their hearts so that they are guided. All right. Um, we might have time for one more quick question. I'm trying to see if there is a. A quick one. Um, disagreement is due to ego. What is a good way to start controlling our ego? That's not really a quick question, but yeah. yeah the, the, how how can we put our ego aside? You know, we're reading the Quran right now, and this is the month of Quran. A lot of people aren't doing what they're supposed to do right before they read the Quran. What are we supposed to do right before we read the Quran? Ta'awud. فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ You seek protection with Allah from shaitan. Once you say the ta'awud, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ I seek refuge, I seek protection with Allah from shaitan. Because the problem is not with the people. Islamically speaking, people are generally good. Right? The enemy, the common enemy, enemy is shaitan. Once we eliminate this external interferences and we have a clear communication with Allah by stopping and saying a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim with our hearts, inshallah you will be able to put your ego aside. So I would recommend whenever you feel the waswas of shaitan coming in that disagreement with your fellow bro brother or sister, stop and say, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan rajim And if he's still there, then say, brother and sister, I feel like the waswas of shaitan is insuring me right now. Let's meet at another time. And then once you're calm, cool, and collective, maybe you are meeting out at a place outside the restaurant, then it's, uh, maybe don't meet maybe a lot of times I don't meet in the masjid because sometimes the disagreement it, it can get uh, it can get pretty crazy so sometimes when I disagree with someone I tell them hey let's let's take a walk at the Des Plaines River Trail and talk about this so that, that would be my tip to, to you all right well we'll now conclude the Q&A session for today and let folks get ready for iftar once again, Jazakallah Khair, Sheikh Asfar, thank you so much for your insights and practical advice and taking out the time today to teach us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you immensely. I mean, you too. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as rahmatullah. I'd also like to thank our co-host, the Downtown Islamic Center, and our sponsor, Muzaffar Mirza and Associates. And please tune, again, tune in again tomorrow. The speaker will be Mufti Minhaj Adin Ahmed from Dar es Salaam. We'll be discussing Surat al-Araf and Surat al-Infal. And thank you to everyone at home for joining us today for CIOGC's daily Ramadan Tafsir. During this time of isolation, CIOGC is trying hard to keep people connected and provide channels for people to fulfill their ibadah. CIOGC has been helping local mosques and food pantries working through the pandemic and the stay-at-home order. So please remember CIOGC in your duas and support their efforts with your generous donations during this time of need. Jazakallah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.